Um, I encourage everyone to also read their full bios and the agenda, and I'll give a brief overview of everyone's um, expertise here today. So Dr. Erica Harvey is Abuelita uh, Suarez Professor Emeretta and Campus Sustainability Consultant at Fairmont State University. David Kay is Chair of the National Extension Climate Initiative and Critical Issue Leader for Climate Change and Sustainable Energy with Cornell University Cooperative Extension Program. Uh, Dr. Bob Kopp is a Distinguished Professor at Rutgers University and Director of the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub. I hope that's the way you pronounce it. Wonderful. <laughs> um, Dr. Radna Tripathi is a professor at UCLA and Director of the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science. So a great range of perspectives and opinions here today. Um, we'll jump right into guided questions with the panelists followed by substantial time for Q&A, both for online um, and in-person attendees. Um, we have limited time, so we'll try to get into it. The first section, we'll have four minutes each to get into our initial questions. Um, please also submit your questions to the Slido box that was referenced before um, for anyone listening to the live stream right now. I'm excited to get in. So I'll turn to Bob first. So Bob, some of your work has focused on the role of land-grant universities and other institutions of higher education. Can you tell us about some of these institutions about how some of these institutions could help communities around the US become more resilient to climate change. Given their central research, education, and service missions, how can higher education institutions advance climate action and sustainability? And can you also define land grant institution for us as well? Sure, I'll get to that at, at the end. of but First, uh, thank you for the question. Um, thanks to Amanda and thanks to the Academy staff for organizing the, this really great event. Um, so by way of sort of framing the answer to your question and framing the panel, um, back in March last year, our team at Rutgers worked with folks at the University of Washington, with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, with MIT and with other universities to help organize a White House forum and an associated workshop on campus and community scale climate action. And we've been carrying forth some discussions after that with the Academy it's about how to, how to carry on that work. Uh, so for that workshop, we sort of answered your question uh, with four roles for higher education institutions. So I want to go through those and then I'll talk about land grants in particular. So first, higher ed institutions are operators of buildings and particularly for larger institutions of energy systems and transportation systems. So many are effectively centrally planned municipalities and thus microcosms in which climate solutions can be tested and demonstrated. Um, and in terms of relationship with communities, there's an opportunity provided by things like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act to test, to tap into those resources to benefit universities as operational institutions and in coordination with their communities and states. Second, higher ed institutions are, of course, educational institutions, and I think we already mentioned um, in the next session, there'll be a breakout on, on workforce development. So some of that discussion will be picked up there. But, but higher ed plays a key role in developing uh, the decarbonization and adaptation workforce. And that um, includes you know, the community colleges working to prepare the electricians and HVAC specialists. We need to electrify America. And it includes graduate programs like we have one at Rutgers that are working to prepare um, researchers and engagement specialists to take climate knowledge and translate it into forms communities uh, need and to listen respectfully to communities and, and sort of get that co-production going broadly. Um, and also in that educational role, there's the role of preparing all of our graduates for dealing with the realities of a climate altered world. So third, uh, universities are research institutions. That's of course goes without saying here. Uh, but beyond just core research, we also have the opportunity to leverage our nature as, as operators of, of systems um, to demonstrate and deploy innovative technologies. And fourth way I want to focus the rest of remarks I think most of us will be speaking on, um, higher ed institutions can be providers of climate services. So developing research that addresses specific public needs with respect to climate knowledge, translating that research into forms and tools that support science-based decision-making and co-producing solutions to local climate challenges. And I should say, well, there's a booming private sector market in climate services. It's sort of a whole different beast. That private market addresses private needs. It doesn't well serve the needs of municipalities, communities, states that need equitable access to climate knowledge. So universities have been, have been stepping up. There are a bunch of 
two small and two siloed federal programs that I could give you a laundry list of acronyms for. Um, there are also some state level efforts in New Jersey. We have the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But the scale of the effort there doesn't match the scope of the public need. And this is where it brings us to the land grant system. Um, so historically, land grant universities in the US, and there are at least one in every state, um, have linked community needs to academic knowledge and research. So, uh, you know, Rutgers is a land grant institution. Most, of, many of the Big Ten institutions are academic institutions. All of you probably know the name of your land grant institution. And the land grant system rests on a tripod, the first pillar of which dates back to the 1860s. So that's accessible public education provided through the land grant college system. The second two pillars are use inspired research provided by the agricultural experiment stations and very importantly, um, community engagement provided by cooperative extension. I think David's gonna be talking a lot about that. But the land grant model, if we look at that, highlights the central role played by knowledge translators like those in climate extension in building trusted, sustainable links between universities and communities and thus in bridging academic expertise and public need. And if we want to do the same with um, climate, I think we need to think about how we build a system analogous to cooperative extension focused on addressing the climate knowledge needs of our, our states and communities. Thank you for that definition and natural transition here. Um, what's David, what is the role of extension programs in supporting community development and resilience and improving sustainability across the whole institution versus just focusing on the campus? Um, and what are organizational mechanisms that could improve coordination across institutions um, so everyone isn't reinventing efforts? Sure, thank you. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the Academy for having this panel and including uh, as part of the panel, a, you know, a sense that Bob just introduced so eloquently of the broad array of types of impacts and influences that higher education can have. I am going to focus specifically on the cooperative extension system, which I'm most involved in. Um, so first thing I say, there's over 100 years of public investment, just to kind of build a little on what Bob was talking about. In, uh, in really a, an educational social infrastructure that the Cooperative Extension represents. We serve every county or county equivalent in the entire country. Uh, I'll just build a little bit on what you said, like our system also includes tribal colleges and historically black colleges and universities, just to add a little bit of, you know, which have some regional diversity and in, in where those institutions are. Um, we also have sister organization in Sea Grant, uh, which focuses on coastal communities. Um, so, um, you know, at the bottom line, our mission and responsibility is serving the public at its most uh, fundamental level, uh, or you can think of it differently as a very broad array of non-academic constituencies and communities. So the way we do this and the, what the infrastructure actually consists of is more than 30,000 educators around the country that typically live in, not always, but typically live in the communities that they serve. So um, we claim, and there's some hard evidence to support this, something that I think is really increasingly important in the dialogue, and I've heard alluded to many times here. We claim that because of this infrastructure, which has long-term commitments to community, that we have relatively high levels of trust in the communities that we work with, which is, and Bob alluded to this as well, but I think that, you know, that's not universally true with every community on every issue, but it is a sense of, uh, you know, something about uh, the ability, if you will, to communicate with your audience depends on trust and the ability as educators to connect with your community really depends on trust. And I really, I really see that our ability to have credibility, uh, you know, in what our, you know, what our mission is, as I like to use the term of producing evidence-based information more than research-based information. And I say that because there's a lot of issues, particularly in the climate change arena, where we're kind of like, we have to educate ahead of where all of, all of the sort of settled science is because people are making decisions today about things that I work on and other people work on, for example, about what are the impacts of large-scale solar development on communities? 
the empirical base for that, looking backwards, is very, very thin right now because large scale uh, hasn't been around very long. So um, anyway, I want to emphasize in the, in the context of, um, of all of this that um, we have a, uh, you know, a system that uh, is underutilized and underappreciated. And one of the things that we're also trying to really work really hard on is ways to integrate the missions of research, you know, my words for what you said are research, teaching, and extension, as well as sort of the institutional impact and footprint that you also alluded to. I will say as a, as a chair of my own city's uh, uh, Sustainability and Climate Justice Commission that, that when the community looks at my institution of Cornell University, what they are usually actually looking to is less the research, teaching, and education missions, and more like what is the impact of this business which operates in our community on the community in terms of jobs, uh, services demanded, uh, revenue sources, and things like that. Um, so, uh, your second question, you had a second question in there at the end. Could you just repeat that? What are organizational mechanisms um, that we could use to improve cross-coordination of institutions so people aren't duplicating efforts? Right, so I'm gonna say that um, probably one of the key things, so I started my career like most of us in academia and an extension like with uh, social science training and particularly in economics. Um, what I, you know, as I've gotten older and more and more uh, into this kind of role that I'm in now, one of the things that I think has been most significant for me to learn is that I need to move out of an information, a pure information delivery mode and into a mode of the way I like to think about it is how do I create environments? What can I do as an educator to create environments in which people can learn? And one of the things that I'm gonna just also emphasize in this is, which I think the Academy, and I've been very impressed with what I've sort of seen about the breadth of the Academy's work is the need for partnerships in the context of interdisciplinary. And so like I'm particularly interested and a number of the organizations that I uh, try and collaborate with have what they call networks of networks. Um, so, because we can't cover it all, and I'm not so worried even about duplication of networks too much, because I think that to some degree, uh, when you have um, you know different networks that uh, maybe seem like they're doing the same thing, they actually open the door to greater levels of inclusion and involvement because not everybody's gonna join the same network or same organization. So to some degree, at least, I'm not that worried about like overlaps and duplication. I actually think it's good. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's really, really important to emphasize trust, building integrity of these programs. So thank you for emphasizing that. Um, next to Erica, um, can you share your efforts um, to work with students to engage local communities um, to improve campus sustainability at Fairmont State University and any context you want to offer on it being a rural serving institution and um, distinctiveness of that institution type? Thank you. Yeah, and thank you to the academies for inviting a regional public comprehensive institution to this table. Um, I resonate so much with many of the things you guys said about uh, extension and um, and it's different uh, for us because that's not an explicitly funded piece of our mission but it's definitely part of what uh, public comprehensives do we um, Fairmont State we serve about we're in north central West Virginia we serve about 3,500 students um, undergraduate education is the focus of the campus and um, pretty much all the work that we do has students involved in some way. In fact, Eliza Keener is here with me today. She's an undergraduate at Fairmont State, a mechanical engineering technology major. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit about our student body because I want to say that it represents our community. And these public comprehensive universities, that's true for all of us in community colleges across the, across the nation. Um, we are 90% of our students are from West Virginia. Two thirds of them are actually from the seven county region right around Fairmont State. And so they're community members. They are the community. And 40% are uh, Pell recipients. About 40% are first generation. 
um, and 90% are rural. So pretty much all of West Virginia is rural. Uh, <laughs> we, um, I, I want to talk about, so our students, I believe, re reflect the political climate of the state. And um, that, uh, instead of being a conflict, um, I think we've all worked to try to get past the memes and the sound bites and get to a place of rolling up our sleeves together to look at our common problems. Because once uh, we had a wonderful professional development session by Rita Smokestein years ago, and uh, she said that, can you figure this out is the mating call of the brain. And so once you have a problem and you look at the data for it, look how much we're spending on, on uh, electricity on our campus, suddenly solutions begin to pop up. And um, so a little bit more framing about the campus. We have uh, inactive mines underneath the campus. There are some pillars still of support. And then there's active mining um, adjacent to the campus. I believe that's still active. It was a year ago. I recently retired as a chemistry professor. I loved the uh, Anderson Law idea. Uh, <laughs> and um, at the same time, we have solar panels, um, a small array, but it's a demonstration. It's a very public part of campus. It's on a steep south-facing hillside that was really hard to maintain for facilities before. We planted wildflowers around it at student insistence. It's pretty beautiful now. And um, the first panels were funded by Dominion Energy, which is a natural gas company that uh, gives back to communities for community initiatives. The next set of panels uh, were funded by an Earth and Space Science Passport grant um, for teachers. So it was teacher training, and K-12 teachers were able to use those, the data from the panels, in their classrooms. So I, I think integrating with our communities is at the heart of what we do, and most of the faculty are conscious all the time, I think, of this tripartite mission and how we can, with pretty heavy teaching loads, integrate all those pieces of scholarly activity, research, and teaching with our service mission and our outreach mission, and how we involve students in all parts of that. Um, Eliza's class, um, Eliza was a member of a class that I taught a year ago on campus sustainability. Two of the students in that class had coal miners in the family, but we started looking at the power bills on campus. We um, investigated the Inflation Reduction Act incentives that have been made available. We uh, took, uh, a look at the law that had recently passed in West Virginia for um, legalizing power purchase agreements. And, and the students, uh, I love that description of the interdisciplinary team because that's exactly what happened. Here's a problem, let's figure it out. They made a pitch to the executive leadership team for a couple of solar options. And I think we're almost ready to, uh, this fall, install another set of panels um, taking advantage of some of these credits uh, available to us. And I think that I hit on everything I needed to say. Thank you. That was an awesome example. That's very inspiring to hear. Um, going to Aradna next. Um, can you share about your work to advance climate justice within communities? Also, if you feel free to define climate justice, there's a lot of definitions, so define your version of climate justice. Um, and different mechanisms you use to also advance this work. Thank you. I'm so inspired by what I just heard. And to me, that is an example of climate justice. It involves empowering communities, putting uh, knowledge and solutions in their, in their hands directly so that they can make informed decisions. And I love that visual of rolling up our sleeves to work on problems together. And so that's really at the heart of what we do at the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science is we work on being in community together to address issues and to work together across real and perceived difference. Um, we have at the heart of our work an ecosystem of fellowship programs. We have community fellows, we have early career fellows, and we have faculty fellows. So I like to joke, we're from K through gray, you know, and um, <clears throat> yeah, and you know, all of us are drawn together by our passion for making a difference, for working together. Um, and so we spend time in engaged listening, learning from each other and working on community identified problems. Um, actually, just right here um, at this meeting, we're grateful to the academies for organizing it and for giving us the opportunity to 
bring a group of our community fellows and early career and faculty fellows to participate here. Um, <clears throat> so some of the fellows that are here have been really at the forefront of calling for accelerating decarbonization. And the reason why is actually because of the health impacts of carbon emissions. Um, some of the people who are here grew up across the street from a site where there were about 20 or so, 21 oil wells. And so I've been dealing from a young age with the health impacts, asthma, can elevated risks of cancer. Um, and so this meant that families from this frontline community uh, were feeling really the impacts and recognized that across Los Angeles, which is the largest urban oil field in the country, there are a number of families, in fact, that were having something taken away from them with respect to their health and whether or not you recognize that this, in fact, was happening. And so because of their um, expertise, they're identifying that there was a problem because of the resources that the uh, center, the university brought um, to their disposal, they were able to um, be empowered in engaging with using GIS as a tool for taking their taking health data, taking air pollution data, data on the location of oil and gas wells, and showing how these things are co-located. And then in turn, empowerment also led them, uh, supported their organizing. They organized a number of different groups in a coalition together, or it's called Stand, Stand LA is the group, and they called for uh, a medical buffer zone around residences, schools, and hospitals around LA City, LA County, and those things got unanimously passed about three years ago. And then that eventually led to a state bill that actually uh, Governor Newsom signed into law um, in 2022. And there was, uh, uh, so, I mean, this just goes to show how on the backs of a group of community organizers, a group of families in a frontline community and together and the resources that higher education was able to bring to support them in their work, that was a, now a gift to every single person living in the state. Right? And this is a model for what can happen around the country when we empower people, support people from frontline communities and bring the resources that universities have, which we heard from Marsha earlier in the week, the energy and enthusiasm and brilliance of our students, uh, the expertise of faculty and the resources that the university has to the community to support their, their organizing. So to me, that's another example of climate justice and what that, what that looks like. Great case example. So we're gonna move on to the next part of our panel. So these questions are for everyone, but hopefully that not everyone goes at once, all at once. Um, we'll focus on positive storytelling first and then go into challenges next. Um, to really, I think this really goes a natural transition from your last point too. Are there examples of how higher, um, specific higher education institutions or types of institutions um, have been supporting and learning from their communities. Um, what learning can schools implement from this? Uh, case examples that you offered or the examples we offer on stage and welcome uh, whoever wants to start first. Yeah, so I think one really uh, in incredible example that comes to my mind is the leadership from uh, Bob Bullard, Beverly Wright, where um, you know, we see at the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice the incredible work that they're doing, um, leveraging a network of HBCUs, building up capacity at individual HBCUs to support so that student and faculty leadership can support community leaders in developing and implementing programming that they think is important. Um, most recently, they have been awarded an EPA Tic Tac or Thriving Communities grant, um, which is actually supporting them as a, a also in um, sustaining this work, but also as a regranting organization so that different community-based organizations can come to them with ideas for research projects and then ensure that they can implement these with the resources that are needed from uh, the universities themselves. I think this is also a really powerful model, not only because of the work that is happening, but also because of the workforce development that's happening. What we're seeing is that the next generation of scientists are being trained in ways so that they have the cultural awareness 
um, and the relationships with the communities that some of them are part of and some of them may not be part of, but those relationships are ones that are gonna sus be sustained for generations to come. We certainly model the work that we're doing at the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science with what we are seeing there. Another wonderful example um, is the work that Carletta Chief and others are doing at the Indigenous Resilience Center at the University of Arizona, where they work closely with Diné College, Navajo Technical University, these two tribal institutes, and a number of Navajo partners. Um, uh, Carletta herself is actually an extension specialist, and so uh, at this particular land grant university, they're doing incredible work being part of the community because they hold that, that deep trust that we were hearing about as being, being key. Other examples you want to offer? I might um, kind of jump in and maybe uh, respond to this that are more a level of kind of, I think, that we all need to think about heavily in the face of what many people, I think, correctly think of as a climate emergency. And this is the, the uh, speed at which we can foster organizational change and responsiveness. So I want to highlight one of the roles that I think Extension plays because it has, if you will, eyes and ears and hands and feet in all communities across the country is our ability to respond to emerging issues being different uh, and more grounded than, uh, than it might be in the research community with our, with our research colleagues, which I'm also part of as well. But, um, so I'll give two examples uh, that I've been involved in. One was, you know, our engineering colleagues made these, this incredible uh, ability to extract natural gas from shale uh, a couple of decades ago. Very controversial topic. Uh, in fact, my state ended up banning it, uh, banning high volume hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but the point I wanna make is like, we learned on campus that that was an issue when many of our landowners and our communities were being approached by energy companies uh, that were saying, hey, could we lease your land for hydraulic fracturing? So I have to say that, you know, we started in an extension role talking to people on campus and they said, most of them said, well, you know, that's not really that interesting a topic to us. As it started hitting the front pages of the paper, though, we actually were able to develop pretty robust educational and, and even stimulate uh, significant research programs at our institution. And some of our faculty are now kind of world famous because of their, their work on that issue. Uh, not that they all agreed with each other, but. <laughs> uh, and I'll just give another example, which is contemporary and which I'm working on now, which is the same story really came around with uh, solar, large scale solar deployment. So like, how did we learn about large scale solar deployment, which not that many people were interested in. Uh, you know, we heard earlier about the incredible decline in the cost of solar. So it's now in many places <laughs> the most cost efficient way of producing electricity. Well, we learned about that on campus as a major issue, primarily because landowners were approaching our educators at the county level saying, solar companies are asking to lease land from us now. So again, how do we respond to that? We had to sort of, you know, uh, there's an institutional shift because like most research faculty don't suddenly change their agendas in terms of what they're trained in and what they're interested in because there's a new issue in the community down the road. So we have to work you know, as intermediaries uh, in trying to work between community in both directions, between the community and the research uh, faculty and the teaching faculty to try and sort of do what the organization I work with, which is the National Extension Climate Initiative is really all about, which is trying to mobilize the resources of the land grant university to address some of the most salient issues in climate change. That was really robust. We're really close to time, so I'm actually going to save the next question for Erica and Bob. That's okay. Moving on to challenges. Um, what do you see as the biggest barrier to higher education playing a more transformational role in addressing climate change? How might that barrier be addressed? Are there missing tools that could allow us to more fully tap the transformational potential of higher education and climate action? And also, how are you able to talk or socialize about this work? Were languages effective given this political landscape we're in? Touching on any of those things. And maybe start with Erica and go to Bob. Sure. I, I, um, I think hard piece we learned during the pandemic by accident. Um, when the pandemic happened, 
we had huge Earth Day celebrations set up sort of around the state at different colleges, but everything got shut down. And so we um, start, started to form a network. And you said there's these networks of networks, but I think there's a lot of schools that aren't connected to networks yet. And uh, that was a huge benefit to us to be able to find out what was going on at other, other schools. And then K-12 schools also got really interested in this network of networks, but we haven't been able to sustain that. So once everything opened back up, we started to do things on our own campuses again. And I think a microcosm of that on our campus is that there are faculty in occupational safety and community health and chemistry and biology and uh, engineering who are doing really neat stuff with climate change, but we don't know about each other central mechanism that keeps us connected so it's it's on the people who are doing that work to try to keep that network going so for me I think that's one challenge that maybe there's some way we could work on together how do you connect people to the institution how do you give the institutional administration incentives to connect people around climate and then how do you connect institutions in the state um, outside of the the extension network is because we all have to be part of this solution that's a big part of my work at Second Nature too, is connecting people and making sure folks are aware of the work already happening across institutions. So really important point. Um, going to Bob next. So I, mean, I think a theme that a bunch of people have brought up and I, I think I want to emphasize is human capacity. Um, if you want to effectively link what's going on in communities and community needs to the research and education mission of the campus, you have to view that as a core priority. Has, there have to be people associated with that. You can't do that for all of Aradna's great work. Moonlighting geochemists cannot maintain, uh, you cannot anchor these relationships. That's, that's why things like extension are so important. Um, and we have this term at research universities of core facilities, or at least we do at Rutgers. I think it's pretty common. Core facilities are shared resources that are platforms for research and teaching used by multiple people on the, on the campus to enable things that wouldn't be able to happen otherwise. And those relationships between campus and the community are a core facility. And if you're going to treat it as a core facility, you need people whose job it is to maintain and run those. Um, and you know, in some cases, extension in the from you know, the, the National Cooperative Extension is doing it. And many other cases, uh, and there really is the dominant modus uh, Rutgers, you know, we have, we've been lucky to have some really great professionals, um, typically hired on a grant to grant position, uh, typically, I'd say 90% women uh, in, so in, these, in these precarious uh, 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 job titles. Um, and that, you know, at Rutgers, we've been, you know, we're active in this area for a decade and a half, and that's enabled us uh, to build up a statewide network of NGOs and businesses and, and, and governments to advance an adaptation agenda, even during a period when the state government had decided it was no longer really interested in climate as a priority. It's uh, allowed us to, to get the state legislature to, to set up a, a center for court, tapping into the entire higher ed sector of the state, of the state to inform climate decision making, the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. Um, it's enabled us to set up a graduate program to train people to, to talk to people. And, and, and so as, as we were saying, you need to do to do climate problems. And all of that has been enabled by a relatively small number of climate engagement specialists. Um, and so if you want to do that at scale, you need to invest in scale. Um, you know, that's what, that's, you know, if we were to torque the entire cooperative extension network to solving the climate problem, that's the scale of what we need. Now, cooperative extension does a lot of things. It's not going to be torqued towards solving the climate problem. Uh, but we need, I think that's, that's sort of where we need to build up. We need, we need a net, network of people whose job is to hold and maintain these relationships and it can't be funded one piecemeal grant at, at a time. And we have to be incentivizing the entire, you know, we also have to deal with the incentives of the, of the rest of the faculty at the universities uh, to, you know, you know, if you have to talk to people, it takes longer to publish papers than if you're just sitting in front of your computer publishing papers. And so if our entire sentiment system remains geared towards sitting at our computer and, and, and doing molecular simulations, um, that, uh, you know, that, that's going to put a hamper on us too. Yeah, and human capital, not something AI can do. Right. <laughs> it requires human relationships. Yeah. 
Um, independently say is like, we didn't coordinate on those answers, but I couldn't have answered the same, I wouldn't have answered the same question any differently except less eloquently than my colleague. <laughs> Love that acquisition. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, at this time, we're transitioning to audience Q and A. Um, so, if you want to ask a question, please make your way to the mic on this side of the stage, um, and we'll take your questions between that and online questions. Um, so, feel free to make a line now, and we'll try to get to everyone and try to get as, as many people as possible. And we might as well go to online question first. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, like you just said, so we had a million great questions virtually yesterday. Um, we didn't have time to get to all of them, so we're really going to do our best to go through as many questions today as we can. Um, and we also encourage audience members to upvote, who are in Slido, to upvote questions, as that will help us focus on the ones you're most interested in. Uh, and so the first question today from our virtual audience is, what can larger universities do to help out and guide smaller universities and community colleges in addressing climate issues on their campuses? David, do you want to take this? Well, so I'm going to say that our system, just the extension system uh, and land-grant university system includes large and small you know, within itself. So I'm going to, you know, one of the things that uh, we try and do is, and one of the reasons the National Extension Climate Initiative was formed was actually to network, primarily network, share resources, and advocate for climate work. So, and we do not have boundaries on our membership. I would encourage everybody to check it out. Like, if you're, if you're, if you're an educator or interested in education and working on climate-related issues, we're not gonna say, oh, like, are you actually with the Land Grant University? We're interested in working with you together. I'm gonna to just mention that we also have, we collaborate closely even within our own system with uh, a whole group of our educators who are uh, community development professionals, which relates to the issues we were talking about earlier. And we also have a very long standing part of our organization called the Extension Disaster Education Network. So the framing I wanna put on this is we serve communities. So we're going to try and do whatever we can to, as I said, mobilize our system and the networks that our system is in to better serve communities. And there isn't the same kind of pressure on extension educators. Uh, it's a different kind of pressure, but to sort of like be the, you know, be the sole author or the lead author on a paper. You know, we're really there trying to solve problems for the community members we're with, with all the partners that are relevant. Thank you. Any other quick responses to that before we move on? I just want to say that uh, being not excluded is different from being invited and included. Yeah. So maybe there need, you know, maybe there could be something that is more official. Um, that's a network that recognizes different kinds of institutions and their roles. So in, in New Jersey, we, we've had a, um, a sustainability alliance with the higher ed institutions that's gone through waves of, of being more and less active, um, and is currently uh, uh, on a, on a Revigor invigorating trajectory. Um, but one of the things that have come up in the discussions, like at Rutgers, so we have a relatively new Office of Climate Action across the university. Um, and one of the, and I, I'm not quite sure what in the progress is. Well, one of the things that, that has come up, and well, they realized they needed to hire somebody to help them figure out how to navigate IRA and Bill and, Bill and all of those resources. And I think they, 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 man they managed to almost get there. But that, that it was even on the table is something that could only happen at a large university. Right. But the, the, the structure of the problem is not that different from anybody else who operates as energy and transportation systems, whether it's a community college or Rutgers or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, New, Jersey, uh, New, Jersey, New Jersey State College. Um, and so sharing, you know, having those networks at a working level um, across this, you know, it can enable can enable places that can invest in in a little bit more knowledge to to share that and, and help tap into this. We've seen something similar in that there's been a strong interest from our community college and four year MSI partners in um, building partnerships where we're sharing infrastructure, we're sharing human resources, we're sharing curriculum. Um, and providing opportunities really, for example, for our graduate students and faculty to work with undergraduates and support 
faculty at the, the other institutions. So that may look like sharing service learning opportunities, um, course-based undergraduate research experiences, um, you know, as, a, as an, another example, writing grant proposals together based on listening sessions with a less resourced partner um, are just a few examples. Yeah, I really um, I have to transition to in-person, but I want to take this first in-person question here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a retired biochemist, uh, and I became a climate activist in 2016. And I'm kind of amazed that most of the faculty at my institution didn't get the didn't move in that direction, given the climate emergency that we're facing. I've been working with uh, the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, a professional agency, to get them more invested in actually thinking about this as uh, one of their key issues, and almost like an ethical obligation for scientists. Uh, so I was wondering, what can professional organizations do within the sciences to get their own people moving in a more collective fashion? Mm, get young people moving. Let's see. Aradna, do you want to start us off? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm really appreciative uh, of that question. And I think back to um, this convening that was organized by a group of professional societies around issues relating to gender equity, harassment, and discrimination several years ago. It was pre-COVID, um, and so we saw that AGU and the American Astronomical Society, ACS, APS, they actually um, convened about 100 people from across the community to talk about what can professional societies do to catalyze transformation. I think something similar could potentially even be done in the climate and uh, environment and sustainability and resilience space. I think you know you've just pointed to how there's a real need for having something like this right now, um, and I think we've seen in the conversations, the fireside chats that have happened yesterday and today, in fact that the the leaders really up in the in the field see that there's uh, that there's an incredible body of work that the communities that they represent can contribute to. So I'd say the time really is now for doing just that. Well, I just want to emphasize, I think we're, you know, we have, what we're facing really as a society, but also within higher education is the need for rapid organizational change. So as a social scientist and a behavioral scientist and my training, I was trained as an economist, you know, I think we have to have leadership and I think we have to have changes, which Bob alluded to earlier. We have to have significant changes in incentive structures. And I would also argue in this context, in my, I could give some examples, but I want from my own university, we need to change sort of the definitions of excellence. And there's a big debate about this in the, in the higher academy from thinking about disciplinary excel, excellence to problem solving excellence. I want to be mindful of time really quickly. Should we take another um, online question? So our next uh, virtual question, um, as folks line up in here, is what are the responsibilities of universities regarding divestment of environmentally harmful investments, as well as for accepting or rejecting research funding from fossil fuel companies um, in reference to very recent conversations happening at Stanford? Let's go to Erica first on this one. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I talked to an audience member about this right before um, before this panel, and she said, "Yeah, you have to meet people where they are." And so I think if your community is funded by lots of your students are, you know, fossil fuel families, then it makes sense to, um, to use that funding for going forward with green initiatives. Um, because I think the, the future has to be some kind of uh, collaboration. Um, if your community is different from that, then maybe you would make a different choice about that. But I don't wanna dishonor the, the people that I work with and you know, my students. Rod and I think you also have a great point on this. I can build off of Erica. Well, you know, I, I think that 
students have been at the forefront of calling for social change that has uh, seemed radical at the time, but in fact, um, you know, was a vision of where we eventually recognized we should, you know, we more broadly as a society have recognized that we should be heading to in many different areas. And I would look at the civil rights movement and the, uh, you know, what was happening within communities, for example, um, at lunch counters um, and, and on, on buses and the calls for desegregation of schools and then what was mirrored in the black campus movements that we, that we saw. Um, and so with that, I think that the movement for divestment from fossil fuels, we're starting to now increasingly see broader and broader support for whether or not there's political will at a particular time. What we have seen from the historical lens is that this has been an issue at times where there's been bipartisan support. We also see that, in fact, different stakeholders, including business in different sectors, is starting to, to come around. And so it really does look like students were at the forefront of calling for what we're recognizing was morally the right thing. Um, and that being said, you know, when we do a power mapping exercise, we see that the decision to divest are not always ones that can be taken at a department or dean or even chancellor or university president level. Sometimes we're actually having to look at the broader board of regents, for example. Um, at, you know, sometimes these are governor level appointments. And so it is important to recognize that the messaging that needs to happen um, needs to actually also be directed to where those decisions get taken. Right. Um, sometimes you can ask one group to take a decision, but they don't necessarily hold power in that way. So it's, it's, uh, that's part of the reason why sometimes we see systems are slower to change when it comes to looking at kind of university decision making. There's a beautiful book written about this with respect to campus civil rights and the blank campus movement that I think is relevant to thinking about what a fossil, -free, fossil fuel free future looks like at universities which is called the Campus Color Line, it's about university presidents and the challenges they faced in the 20th century as they tried, some of them tried to do the right thing. And so I think it's actually very pertinent to this issue. Great resource. I think we have time for at least two more in-person questions. Okay, we'll take the first one. Hi, Philip Lapel, MIT. Um, we learned about a new law this morning, Anderson's Law, that, that uh, the product of creativity and perspective over time is, is constant. Uh, we tend to think of perspectives in the climate area as being fairly hardened. And I wonder if, if um, you know, this gives us some hope uh, over time. Do we, do you, in, in particular, in terms of expanding people's perspectives on climate and building the coalition of the willing to be far more exclusive and to get to scale, do the tools we're, you're talking about like the networking of networks, connecting together networks that have their own cultures and individuality, and this, this bottom-up community work. Do those offer opportunities to really accelerate the change of perspective on climate that we need? How effective is this network of networks? David, do you want to respond first? Well, I'm going to respond by saying at some level, this is often the case as a social scientist, you know, we look at the relationship between knowledge, belief, attitudes, and in the climate arena especially, I think what's needed is individual and organizational behavioral change. So like, when I think about that, what I think about, it, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to with hardening of beliefs, but what I see is the you know, if you look at the Yale Six uh, America studies on climate, like you'll see, you know, there's there's people all across the board, but there are very few people who are still percentage-wise in America who are still like sort of active deniers. I think they have um, outsized influence in political circles, but not at the community level necessarily. So what I'm trying to point to is, in terms of behavioral change, I think the big challenge is mobilizing the people who already are concerned and believe about this into behavioral change. Um, so it's, so I'm trying to put the emphasis on behavioral change yeah. rather than on sort of awareness and knowledge and so on as much as anything else. Yeah. 
Bob, you want yeah, to so I would say a similar point. Solutions, not, it's not science, I think, is the, 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 the right way to think about it, right? The, the meet people, I think Erica, Erica said this, right? That, that once you actually start looking at solving problems on the ground, you don't, if you, we, we don't need to argue, uh, and I don't think many people actually deny, deny it at this point, except for a very hardened but politically powerful minority about, the, you know, wet, whether, uh, how, how much above the natural trend are warming it. It's a lot. Uh, but once you get start getting to, so, to solutions on the ground, that, that's where you have the power to make progress and you set the table feel a little differently. And what you need in those to help facilitate those dialogues are people like Extension or, or people on the ground in the communities. Um, you know, there's a saying, I think, you know, the Yale, Yale group, I think, summarized it also, but, but message, lots of trusted messengers. Some cases, we're the trusted messengers. Uh, climate scientists actually have pretty high, high reputations, but for some audiences, we're not. And we sh shouldn't be trying to spend our time delivering the message to those messengers. We should be working with people um, who are trusted messengers in those communities. And one of the advantages of having people whose job is to build long-term trusting relationships is that they build long-term trusting relationships that can be used uh, in this manner. So I, I think that, you know if your if your world is limited to you know the three square miles from where we're sitting now, the picture it may be a little more grim than if if we're looking at the country as a whole. I think we have time for one more in-person question, then we'll wrap up. So we have about twenty-five more minutes for questions. So oh. if folks still have some more in-person. Oh, wonderful! Okay, great. We have more time. Great. Questions. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Demarcus Robinson. I'm part of the Center for Diversity Leadership in Science um, at UCLA. So I have two questions. Um, my first question is. Uh, what advice would you give for individuals that wish to start some similar initiatives related to transformative climate action uh, at their university? And my second question is kind of thinking ahead, maybe 10, 20 years from now, with challenges in uh, higher ed, how do you kind of foresee the initiatives that you've been doing now? Uh, how would that change? From, uh, thank you. Yeah. Erica, I don't know if you want to start us off. Maybe can you repeat the first part of your question? Yeah, the first again. part. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I can go too. It was advice for. Um, the first part of the question is what advice would you give uh, for individuals that wish to start similar initiatives at their institutions uh, when it comes to transformative climate action? And then the outlook. Yeah. So I think that um, my advice is listen to the people who are where you are because. Uh, I, I also talked to a woman at Marshall who is doing amazing things, Marshall University in Huntington, uh, with community composting uh, staffed by people who are in recovery. It's collecting stuff from the community. It's on campus. Students work in that. And I, that might not have been where the sustainability office would have started um, with you know, ideas about what could be the most impact on campus. But wow, what a program. And listening to the people who are in, in your community and in your student body seems like the right place to begin for impactful work. And the long-term outlook, I think, will be bigger if we can get some structural incentives to report on this work um, for institutions like ours. If there was something outside us and outside of West Virginia that we were asked to report toward, um, I think we would come up to that challenge. Um, it would always have to be in the context of fiscal uh, stewardship. Um, but people are all behind fiscal and environmental stewardship in Bob, West Bob, Virginia. And then David next. So, so I think two, two things would be helpful, and it, it's sort of on the people doing the work now partly to, to do them. One is models. And what I find is a lot of time the people who are doing the work aren't, don't take the time to d document what they're doing. And so most of what's known is word of mouth. And that's so, so, so do, we, we need to, to do a better job of sharing practices that are working. Um, but the second, conversely, is, is whatever models you look at, your institution is different. Uh, and so you also have to figure out how you adapt models at work to the particularities of your institution's own culture and internal politics. Uh, but we, we need both, you know, there's a lot that can be shared. Uh, and then a lot of the, the how, you, how you go from the general to the specific requires, you know, the, the institutional knowledge as well. 
So I was just going to bring in, in part of the response to this, like a concept that Robert Putnam has really uh, sort of elevated to a very high level in discourse, even though he, I just saw him a couple days ago on, on a show where he says he's very depressed at his failures and making a difference with this. But these are the ideas of bridging capital and bonding capital. So what I heard you talking about was particularly focused on bonding capital, which is the idea of building support with like-minded people within your own community. I just want to bring, in addition to that, the importance of bridging capital, particularly through organizations like the National Extension Climate Initiative, where you're able to work not with only within your own community, but to access resources and, and uh, information and support, moral support of various kinds, from outside the circles that you're already in. So both of those things involve interacting with other people in networks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think what has been said is there's been so much wisdom that is there. And so I just want to emphasize the importance of building relationships and partnership. Then, because um, as we, we heard yesterday about change moving at the speed of trust, relationships really moving at the speed of trust, it's so important to do this work by being in community, creating networks of allies, um, also really engaging in transformative solidarity um, takes actually finding shared interests with people that may um, come from um, sectors that are very different than, than your own and from disciplines that are very different than your own um, and institutions or organizations that are different from your own. And I think that's actually been part of our strength and our success is taking the time to build those relationships and build those bridges. So I, I really appreciate what everybody here has said and want to emphasize that's that. That's time, absolutely. Do we have another online question? Yes. So. Um, Earlier, uh, language Aradna used in talking about health impacts of oil facilities in LA resonates. Uh, families who have had something taken away from them. What framings and language have panelists found to be motivating for people in their communities? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's, it's really important for, in terms of framing these issues, for people to consider sharing a story. Um, and then talking about the broader, the broader numbers, maybe af after that. To me, it was um, hearing this young woman, Nile Kobo, who grew up across the street from this oil and gas well, and hearing her story about the, um, the, the health impacts, the asthma attacks, the cancer hotspot that was there, um, and her fight for justice that moved me to want to then go up to her and to her mom afterwards and say, what can we do as the UCLA and as the center to help support your work? And that's what really then opened the door to building out uh, this relationship that supported their leadership. Um, and that story, when you hear her share her story, and I'll uh, be happy to uh, see if we can put into the chat actually a, a link to a video um, of her speaking at this. Um, second National Conference for Justice in Geoscience, where, where she, she shares uh, the campaign that they led, you know, that moved me to tears. And at the same time, it's also a story that um, when, then, when one thinks about the scale of impacts, that it's not just this one young, one young woman whose mom nearly lost her, it's actually family after family in this community that do. And then you think about the fact that we're all in Los Angeles breathing the same air, right? And so what is it potentially taking away from me or from my 16-month-old son? What might it be taking away from my neighbor? And then you realize that actually most people in the city don't know that LA is the, the largest urban oil field in the country, right? And that it has been taking something away from us. But when you then do share that story and then share the scale of those impacts and share that potential personal loss from that mom, you know, that can resonate with all of us. That then mobilizes people to think about, well, what, what is it that we can do? And what is remarkable about Nayeli and her mom, Monique, was that they took what they were experiencing and that led them to campaign for what eventually became, you know, Senate Bill 1137 in California. That's systemic change, 
right? Just like with what Bob was talking about in calling for actually transformative systemic change in the ways that we're you know, uh, supporting higher ed community partnerships. What they were doing was calling for systemic change. And so at the end of the day, you know, I think the power of storytelling is what brought all of us to the table. It's what moves city council members. It's what moves state members of the state legislature. It's what got people to go out and go vote, you know? And at the end of the day, I think the, the power of a story is where, where it starts. But the numbers, you know, are what also bring all of us to the, the table as well. Yeah, and also leading with vulnerability is a really important point as well. It really brings out the heart of why we're actually passionate about these issues to begin with. Um, I'll be moving down to Erica next. No, I can skip Bob or David. I'll just mention, um, I think back to one of the most influential books I read as a graduate student was called Lost and Change by Peter Maris. And what it, what it does is it looks in a whole bunch of different contexts. It's ancient, because uh, I'm pretty old. But, um, Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what it does, you know, what the lesson I took out of that book, and he looks at everything from urban renewal to uh, people who have lost their partner, you know, life partners in different contexts, is that all change involves letting go of something. So all change, even positive change. So, and that there, in some ways, there needs to be some kind of mourning process, the, you know, some way of processing that in communities. So when I hear stories like this, I also think of, you know, the incredible uh, advancements that have been made in sort of what I, in neuroscience, let's say, about about understanding of trauma uh, of various kinds and what that means for how we as educators and also say I've, I've been most exposed to this through my role as a mediator, which I've also got trained to do, is like really trying to understand the role of trauma in people's lives that you know isn't always from the most you know, something that somebody from the outside would define as trauma, but it's like if it's experienced as a traumatic change, uh, and every, every, I'm trying to emphasize that every element, it may not be traumatic, but it does involve loss. So we really need to pay attention to that and trying to understand how people are receiving the messages that we as educators are trying to engage them with understanding. There's so much being done on trauma. There's now a trauma-informed facilitation that takes consideration all the points you're making. So really important points to emphasize. I think we have time for another online question. Yes, um, and we have time for a couple more in-person questions if anyone else is interested in the, in the auditorium. But um, from online, years of emphasis on the need for STEM have often come at the expense and even dismantling of anthropology and other social science departments. Several speakers here have noted the need for social sciences, arts, and humanities, which is great to hear. What are your ideas for supporting these fields out in the world? Yeah, Rodney. Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I really appreciate that question. Um, you know, the work that we do with, as a center, uh, you know, we're, we're based at UCLA, and I say that we're, we're a reparative organization. Um, and that means, you know, we're a land-grant university. We recognize the responsibilities and also harms associated with uh, that being a land-grant institution when it comes to the Native nations um, in in the, the region. And so our reparative work uh, starts off first on campus. We are engaging, although we're based in a series of different STEM departments, we also have a footprint in uh, the American Indian Studies Center where we're a guest. Um, and uh, their faculty expertise helps to shape the work that we do, both the uh, academic work we do on campus, as well as the work that we do off campus. We're also reparative because of the work that we do with um, uh, less resourced colleges and universities that hold extraordinary expertise and resource in their own right. So we're very proud to be able to work with a network of community colleges and four-year universities. Um, and then we also are reparative in our work with community-based organizations and tribal authorities. Um, but really the foundation for the work that we do comes from the social sciences and humanities. And we really particularly try to honor that through our work with, with ethnic studies programs and American Indian studies in particular. So some of our grants, for example, go in through American Indian studies and the 
overhead that that brings also then goes to resource those universe those portions of the university, and then the research agenda um, and approaches that we use very directly come from, from AIF. Important to note too, there are no HBCUs in California, but a lot of community colleges are dual designated HSIs and AAPI institutions. So there's one add an extra context. Explain what an HSI is. Uh, Hispanic serving institution, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, hey, I, I echo what you're saying about the importance of the social sciences and the humanities. Like, honestly, the nat for, for, for much of what we're talking about about climate, we, we don't actually need transformative adva advances in the physical science. We need transformative advances in the social science. We need visions of where we're headed, right? So it's, it's the social sciences and the humanities where a lot of the breakthroughs have to happen. Um, within the consortium, I lead the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, um, which is involves 13 institutions focused on both the fundamental science and application of, of knowledge related to coastal climate risk management in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, you know, we, we have anthropologists who go out and talk to people to understand how they are experiencing climate change in uh, low-income par renter-dominated parts of, of places like Philadelphia. Um, we have partners at the, our, our art school at Rutgers who are working on documentary films. Um, you know, this all has to be done together. I don't have a concrete idea of how to support the social sciences per se. I would know, like our our school of environmental and biological sciences has, you know, fifteen natural science departments and two two social science departments, and the social science departments um, is both critical to the mission of the school, which is focused on sustainability and has been declining in size over time. Uh, so, so that's a real pro problem. Uh, but one thing is like, as we shift or as we have more of these sort of transdisciplinary problem focused projects, social sciences needs to be on and, and humanity should be on the ground floor uh, with the natural sciences. So, so that's what's one way of doing it, but there's definitely, I, I'm very concerned by the systemic turn. I think your um, land grant institution uh, in your state of West Virginia has recently sort of downsized a bunch of their humanities and social science departments. And, and that seems to be the opposite of the direction of where as a nation we need to go if we actually wanna solve large societal challenges. I'll just put a plug for the arts too. Uh, like um, that transforms everything. That spirit of creativity and just freedom, it, it gets outside of political uh, stuff too. So it, it's absolutely essential. So the arts budget is the always first one to get cut. So very important to emphasize that. We have an in-person question here. Yes, uh, Jim and Ellie, Climate Change Institute. Um, so most of the CO2 emissions in the future will actually occur outside the United States, thinking India, China, perhaps Africa. The question I have is, since those impacts or those emissions will have an impact locally on, on your communities, what is the role of higher education, if any, at, at the global level? And, and what can be done by higher education through its relationships globally to hopefully push people in a direction, for example, in India, not to build you know, several hundred coal fire power plants in the next 10 years. Mm. Also, I roll in offsets as well, but you might want to add in, but um, David first. Well, since I actually am in a department of global development, that's probably a question I should, I should try and respond to. Um, so, um, you know, I think I'm gonna broaden this a little bit uh, to say that this is, you know, I, I've tried to relate over the past 10 years more and more to the 17 sustainable development goals of which client, and one of the things as soon as you start looking into this and what those goals are, and I encourage people who are not familiar with them to pay attention to them, is it's a, you know, it's not a perfect uh, system by any means, but it's a consensus, a globally consensus-based sort of set of goals and targets about how to improve life for everyone on the planet. And one of the things, as soon as you get into it, I, I go to UN meetings about, about this. Uh, you know, you go to the one, the meetings on the sustainable, sustainable development goals like energy and climate change that I happen to be most interested in, and number 16, which is on governance and climate. Everybody is always saying, you know, 
None of the other goals can be achieved unless this one is dealt with, which is true, but it's true for all of them. So, <laughs> and how many are there, just for reference? 17. 17. Yeah. So, um, you know, and there are things about clean air, clean water, gender equity, you know, et cetera, et cetera, urban issues. So it's, it's a very comprehensive framework. And I just want to say that dealing with climate in other countries, and this goes back to that global equity, will not be dealt with if we only focus on the climate goal. It just won't happen um, because, you know, people's lives are being increasingly affected. I, you know, I, for example, I started working with someone in Malawi on, um, on gender equity issues and uh, Tropical Storm Freddie came along about a year and a half ago and suddenly turned that relationship into a relationship about climate change because all of a sudden, as I think a lot of people who are in the space think about climate change, you know, what's the real effect of it in people's lives? It exacerbates inequalities that are already existing uh, and makes them worse. So I don't know if that directly answers your question, but that's what came to my mind. Yeah, thank you for leading well, us off. And well, so two, th two thoughts. So one, you know, what you just said, it's the same thing we're saying about how to engage communities and here too, right? You have to meet people where they are, where their concerns are. You know, if they don't know, uh, you know, whether they're going to be able to afford housing in a month, uh, they're probably not going to spend a lot of time thinking about flooding in 40 years, uh, right? So you have to meet people where their needs are. You need, and all the all the sustainable development goals are part of that. Um, the other thing I think there's a not far from fully tapped potential to use universities has scale crossing institutions. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, we have roots in our local communities here, but we, you know, we also are part of an international network. Like I, you know, we, we all or many of us right, are, are involved in international uh, um, groups. We have collaborators, you know, across the world and that there's not a lot, lot of other institutions that you know go all the way you know have ties that go all the way down from local neighborhoods in you know, you know in, in our, our our region to you know Europe and, and Singapore and Africa it, you know and, and that's a that's a way of bridging communities and a convening power that I think could be more fully tapped into. Yeah, I would also just emphasize that when we look at uh, emissions historically. The U.S. has been the outsized driver of these. Um, when we look at kind of drivers of climate change, again, we we are number one, unfortunately, you know, historically. Um, and so, and when we we look at overall emissions and we look at per capita emissions, the U.S. is at the top, you know. And so, I think we do have a responsibility to work on reducing those things um, at, at the same time, especially, you know, I was just looking at the numbers and, you know, a per, a per capita on average in the U.S., a person here emits on the order of 100 times more than a person in the, uh, in, in the Congo, you know, and we're uh, 10 or 15 times the amount of a person in India. So we have to really also work on what we're doing right here at home um, at, at the same time. And I'd say that really needs to be a priority for us to be able to, on the global stage, be able to lead, right? So, yeah. Erica, do you have anything you wanna add in? Uh, just that I went to the decarbonization in Africa of transportation <laughs> yesterday. I thought that was amazing. And all I kept thinking all the way through it was, oh my gosh, we in West Virginia could use a lot of that information. So I think there are some maybe unexpected um, ways that the academies could um, broker some relationships that don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I think we are gonna wind down our Q&A. Um, that's okay, okay, sounds good. Um, for those of you who did not have a chance to ask a question or share ideas or comments, um, please make sure to use a Slido QR code on the screen over here, and you can submit um, your questions there, and we'll try to integrate them into future discussions, um, and also these panelists are um, free to respond also at some point as well. So thank you to everyone who participated in our Q&A. Um, so round us out, I wanna ask everyone, what is one takeaway you would like to offer the audience to round out your points and all these amazing intersections we've been discussing. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start if that's okay then. Um, you know, I've been um, delighted at the uh, you know, framing conversations we've heard with the fireside chat 
and the uh, the programming that we've we've seen at this meeting and what I've learned from from uh, uh, my fellow panelists here. Um, one of the things that gives me hope is um, knowing that um, uh, something that, that I, I read from a young community college student that she'd posted on Twitter the other day, and it was knowing that um, what we see as um, our ceiling is where the next generation starts from, right? And so um, just the very fact that we're here talking about issues, climate change, decarbonization, the wicked problems that they represent, the need for solutions that center community expertise, that highlight new models for what we can do, looking internationally for incredible examples, uh, and that the next generation is seeing and hearing this, and their boldness, their creativity is what I'm, what I'm excited about. So I think if we can be as assertive as possible in what we reach for, the next generation is gonna then start from that level and be even bolder in what they ask for with addressing the climate crisis and other crises. 100%, I am I'm thrilled to have gotten to hear about so many need initiatives, and I wish many more people could hear about so many need initiatives, and I am very hopeful because of students and because of young people in this country. I'll echo that, I'll just add to me uh, two concepts. One is education starts with listening to people, it mm -hmm. doesn't start with talking. Um, second is just underscore the need for that Bob really raised earlier for serious investment and in, in sort of what I would call capacity building and infrastructure within our own institutions as well as in the communities to be able to sort of form partnerships, networks, and sort of maintain the infrastructure that enables us to communicate with each other. And I'll just say that I've been impressed with how much the National Academies is doing that in some arenas already. Yeah, and I want to echo all that and just basically repeat something I said earlier, which is that from the viewpoint of leveraging higher ed together with communities towards, towards transformative climate action, the marginal value of a skilled connector, a skilled engagement specialist, a skilled knowledge broker is way higher than the knowledge, the, the marginal value of finding one more research faculty. Um, and we are way under invested in that enabling capacity. Um, and so if, if we're serious about this, and universities have been talking about community engaged scholarship for a while now, uh, we, need to, we need to act uh, like we're serious about it. I wonder if that was popular with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Great representation here of all this. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the panel for this discussion, remind the audience so we had a 15 minute break after this um, with several great breakout sessions, including one about designing post-secondary programs, pathways and learning experiences to prepare the future blue and green workforce. And for those interested in engaging more in workforce aspects of this topic, a main stage panel on inequity and climate change. So please give it up for this amazing panel today. Thank you so much.